Matter in nature can be broadly classified into solid, liquid, and gas based on their physical states. We will study the physical properties of those three phases in the next two chapters. Now, let's take a journey into the world of gas. If someone asks you what gas is like, how can you tell him about it? You may say it's something like air or water vapor. Or you may want to generalize it by describing the characteristics of gases. What are gases like? Gases tend to fill a container of any shape or size by expanding spontaneously. Because of this, the volume of a gas equals the volume of its container. They are highly compressible, as you may know from day-to-day -day experiences. Different kinds of gases can mix spontaneously and make homogeneous mixtures. One important thing to note is that gases of different kinds have similar physical properties, even if they have different chemical properties. In gas phase, the distance between molecules, or intermolecular distance, is so large in comparison to that in liquid or solid phase. Each gas molecule behaves as if the others are not present. This is due to the fact that under the normal circumstances, the gas molecules take up only about 0.1% of the total volume. That is why the molecules in gas phase have similar physical properties, no matter how different they are in chemical nature. The properties of gases can be described by pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. Pressure is the force applied to a unit area. This conceptual definition of pressure can be expressed mathematically as force divided by area, or F over A. Let me take some examples to illustrate the pressure area and pressure force relationships. Imagine that the equal vertical force is applied over different areas. Which one would produce greater pressure? The force applied to the smaller area or the force applied to the greater area? Since area is in the denominator, the smaller area will make the pressure greater. Let me take a couple of real-life examples. Imagine that a lady with tennis shoes on steps on your toes by mistake. Well, you may laugh it off and ask her nicely to move her foot away. But what if the same lady wears high heels? You surely will scream to death. No matter she wears tennis shoes or high heels, her body weight remains the same, or the vertical force remains constant. However, the contact areas in the two cases are different. The high heels provide smaller area of contact, and the vertical force is concentrated on that smaller area, producing greater pressure. Now, can you see how pressure and area are related? The smaller the area becomes, the greater pressure is produced. They are inversely proportional to each other. Now, let me show you how pressure and force are related. This picture shows a cylindrical container that is filled with water. It has three holes that are equally spaced and vertically aligned. It is certain that the cross-sectional areas at the locations of the three holes are equal. However, the weight of water or the vertical force exerted by water is least at the top but greatest at the bottom. 
the length of ejected water is proportional to the pressure. It implies the fact that the greatest vertical force is at the bottom and produces the greatest pressure. It further implies that pressure is directly proportional to the applied force as long as the cross-sectional area remains constant. Atmospheric pressure is the weight of air per unit area. An Italian physicist and mathematician, Torricelli, performed an interesting experiment to measure atmospheric pressure. He used a 1.2 meter long glass tube and filled it with mercury. He sealed its open end by placing his finger over the end and inverted the tube into a dish containing more mercury and removed his finger. He noticed that the mercury in the glass tube flowed down and stopped at a certain height. He realized that the height of the mercury column is dependent on air pressure. The air pressure exerted on the surface of mercury in the dish is equal to the pressure exerted by the mercury in the glass tube. If you bring the same mercury column from the sea level to the summit of Everest, what would happen to the height of the mercury column? Would it increase or decrease? Since the air at the summit of Everest is noticeably less than that at the sea level, the height of mercury column will decrease. Let's calculate the magnitude of pressure exerted by a column of air with cross-sectional area of 1 meter squared that is extended through the entire atmosphere. The mass of the air column is approximately 10,000 kilograms. We learned in high school physics that force is mass times acceleration. Since the force that we are dealing with is vertical force, the acceleration can be replaced by Earth's gravity. G, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. The force is 10,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is equal to 1 times 10 to the fifth kilograms meters per second squared, or 1 times 10 to the fifth newtons. Since the pressure is defined by force over area, the pressure of the air column is 1 times 10 to the 5th newtons divided by 1 meter squared, which is equal to 1 times 10 to the 5th newtons per meter squared and 1 times 10 to the 5th pascal. Standard atmosphere pressure is 1 atm, which is equal to 760 millimeter mercury or 760 torr or 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth pascal. As I said in the previous slide, the physical state of a gas can be described by four variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. There are three gas laws they show the relationships among those four variables. The three gas laws are Boyce law, Charles law, and Avogadro's law. The Boyce law demonstrates how pressure is related to volume at constant temperature in quantity. Look at this illustration. Let's assume that the cylindrical container has fixed amount of gas. The movable piston keeps the gas inside the container. So the quantity of gas or the moles of gas remains constant. Assume that the temperature of the gas also remains constant. When you push the piston to compress the gas inside, what would happen to the volume and pressure of the gas? As the gas is compressed, 
the volume of the gas decreases and its pressure increases as a result. It implies that the pressure and volume of gas are inversely proportional to each other. This leads to Boyle's law. It states the volume of a fixed quantity of gas at constant temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure. This can be expressed mathematically like this. You may use a proportionality constant k and the expression can be written v equals k times 1 over p or simply pv equals k. It implies the pressure of gas multiplied by its volume always makes a fixed value no matter what state the gas is in as long as the temperature remains constant. Experimental evidence of Boyle's law is given in these two graphs, demonstrating the volume of gas is inversely proportional to pressure and directly proportional to 1 over pressure. The Charles law shows how temperature is related to volume at constant pressure and quantity. Look at the picture on the right. An air-filled balloon is immersed in liquid nitrogen. The temperature of liquid nitrogen is below negative 196 Celsius or negative 321 Fahrenheit. Under such low temperature, the air inside a balloon is cooled and liquefied. This leads to a sudden decrease of the volume of the balloon. When it is taken out of the liquid nitrogen, the temperature of the balloon increases gradually and its volume also increases gradually. Once the temperature of the balloon increases to room temperature, it recovers its original shape. This demonstrates that the volume of gas is directly proportional to temperature. This leads to Charles law stating the volume of fixed amount of gas at constant pressure is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. This can be expressed mathematically V equals K times T or V over T equals K. Take a note that the lowercase k represents a proportionality constant. Experimental evidence of Charles' law is shown in this graph. The volume of gas is plotted with respect to temperature in Celsius. It clearly demonstrates the trend of increasing volume of gas as its temperature increases. Take a note that the red best-fit line is extended and crosses x-axis or axis of temperature at negative 273.15 Celsius. This is called absolute zero or zero Kelvin. So zero Kelvin is equal to negative 273.15 Celsius. Be aware that the temperature in Charles law is in absolute temperature scale. Avogadro's law shows how volume and moles of gas are related. It states the volume of gas at constant temperature and pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. This can be expressed mathematically. V equals constant times number of moles N. Interestingly, the volume of one mole of any real gas is or 22.4 liters at 0 Celsius and 1 atm. The volume of three real gases, helium, nitrogen, and methane, are shown on the right under the condition of 0 Celsius and 1 atm. I will talk more about it in the next slide. Boyce's law, Charles' law, and Avogadro's law shows that 
volume of gas is inversely proportional to pressure, directly proportional to temperature, and directly proportional to number of moles. These three gas laws can be combined into a single proportional relationship. That is, the volume of gas is proportional to nT over P. If we use a proportionality constant R, it turns into an equation. V equals R times nT over P. The proportionality constant R is called gas constant. This equation is called ideal gas equation, and it can be rewritten as PV equals nRT. Ideal gas is a hypothetical gas consisting of identical particles of negligible size with no intermolecular forces. It obeys the ideal gas equation. This 3D plot exhibits possible states that ideal gas may take, which is represented by the area in light blue. The gas constant R is 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole per Kelvin, or 8.314 joule per mole per Kelvin. Be aware that the two values have different units, but they are equivalent to each other. You are going to use the gas constant numerous times for problem solving. It is very critical to use the gas constant with an appropriate unit to get the correct answer. The volume of 1.000 mole of an ideal gas at STP can be calculated using the ideal gas equation. STP stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure, which are 273.15 Kelvin and 1 atm. The ideal gas equation can be rewritten with respect to volume, that is, V equals nRT over P. Plug all the given values. Then, it will be 1.000 mole times 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole per Kelvin times 273.15 Kelvin divided by 1.000 ATM. The units of mole, Kelvin, and ATM are cancelled. The remaining unit is liter, which is a unit of volume. Finally, the volume of ideal gas at STP is 22.41 liters. Be aware that you must use the appropriate gas constant in this particular problem, which is 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole per Kelvin, not 8.314 joule per mole per Kelvin, because the pressure of gas is given with the unit of ATM. Interestingly, the volume of one mole of real gases at STP condition are almost same. This is one of the characteristics of gases that I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter. Let's try a practice problem. Calcium carbonate decomposes upon heating to give calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. A sample of calcium carbonate is decomposed and a carbon dioxide is collected in a 250 ml flask. After the decomposition is complete, the gas has a pressure of 1.3 atm at a temperature of 31 Celsius. How many moles of CO2 gas were generated? Unless otherwise stated, all gases are assumed to behave ideally. We should determine the number of moles of CO2 that is produced in the course of decomposition of calcium carbonate. What equation do we have to use for this problem? 
It is the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. The equation can be modified like N equals PV over RT. The pressure of gas product, which is CO2, is 1.3 atm. Now, what gas constant do we have to use? 0 0.08206 liter atm per mole per Kelvin or 8.314 joule per mole per Kelvin. Since the gas pressure is given with a unit of atm, we should use the gas constant with a unit that contains ATM. So, we should use 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole per Kelvin for this problem. The volume of gas is 250.0 mils because it is equal to the volume of its container. When you try a problem like this one, you should always make the units consistent. So in this problem, we should use liter for volume unit, Kelvin for temperature unit, and ATM for pressure unit, because these units are consistent with the unit of gas constant. The volume of 250.0 mL can be converted to 0.2500 liter. The temperature in Celsius is converted to the one in Kelvin simply by adding 273.15. So 31 Celsius is converted to 304 Kelvin. Let's plug these values into the equation. The moles of CO2 gas is 1.3 atm times 0 0.2500 liter divided by 0 0.08206 liter atm per mole per Kelvin times 304 Kelvin, which is equal to 0 0.013 mole of CO2. We derived the ideal gas equation from the three gas laws. Alternatively, we can also derive the three gas laws from the ideal gas equation. Assume that the moles and the temperature of ideal gas are maintained constant during the expansion or compression process. This makes the right side of the ideal gas equation a constant as a whole. The N is held constant, R is the gas constant, and T is held constant. Constant times constant times constant makes another constant. So NRT is a constant as a whole. It implies as long as the moles and the temperature of gas are held constant, P times V always makes a constant value or a fixed value, no matter what physical state the gas is in. This is the Boyle's law. It means that initial pressure times initial volume is equal to final pressure times final volume, or P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. In case that only final volume V2 is unknown, while others are predetermined or known, then V2 can be easily determined by calculating V1 times P1 over P2. Let's assume that the moles and the pressure of ideal gas are held constant. Now, the ideal gas equation consists of variables and constants. P, N, and R are constants, and V and T are variables. Let's move the variables to the left side of the equation and keep the constants on the right side. The equation can be modified like V over T equals NR over P. 
since an R over P is a constant as a whole, V over T always makes a constant value, no matter what physical state the gas is in. This is the Charles law. It implies that V over T of the initial state equals V over T of the final state. In other words, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. This equation can be modified to T2 over T1 equals V2 over V1. The final volume V2 can be expressed as V1 times T2 over T1. Let's assume that the temperature and the pressure of ideal gas are held constant. Just like we did before, let's move the variables to the left side of the equation and keep the constants on the right side of the equation. The ideal gas equation can be modified to V over N equals RT over P. Since RT over P is a constant as a whole, V over N makes a constant value no matter what physical state the gas is in. This is the Avogadro's law. Just like before, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. The final volume V2 can be expressed as V1 times N2 over N1. What if only N is held constant? Well, we still can do the same. Keep the variables in the left side of the equation and constants in the right side. This would modify the equation to PV over T equals NR. The NR is a constant. It implies that PV over T of the initial state equals PV over T of the final state. In other words, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. The final volume V2 can be determined by calculating V1 times P1 over P2 times T2 over T1. The ideal gas equation can be modified to determine the density and molar mass of gases. Keep in mind that all gases will be assumed to behave ideally unless otherwise stated. Ideal gas equation can be re-expressed as P over RT equals N over V. We may multiply both sides of an equation by the same value without affecting equality. Okay, multiply both sides by the molar mass of gas, which is represented by capital M. Take a note that the unit of molar mass is grams per mole. The new equation is PM over RT equals MN over V. Find out overall unit of the right side of the equation. Once again, the unit of molar mass is grams per mole and unit of N is mole. The overall unit of the numerator is simply grams because moles are cancelled. The unit of the denominator or the unit of the volume is liters. So the overall unit of the right side of the equation is grams per liter. What physical property has a unit of grams per liter? That is right, it is density. So the density of ideal gas is equal to PM over RT. If the density of gas is known, then the molar mass of the gas can be determined simply by solving the equation 
for capital M. That is, M equals DRT over P. Let's try a practice problem. What is the density of carbon tetrachloride vapor at 714 torr and 125 Celsius? The molar mass of carbon tetrachloride is 154 grams per mole. The temperature, 125 Celsius, can be converted to 398 Kelvin by adding 273.15. The gas pressure, 714 torr, should be converted to pressure in ATM. Previously, we learned that 1 ATM is equivalent to 760 torr. This can be used as a conversion factor. As a result, 714 torr is converted to 0 0.939 ATM. The density of carbon tetrachloride is equal to PM over RT. Plug all values into this equation. Then the density is 0 0.939 ATM times 154.0 grams per mole divided by 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole per Kelvin times 398 Kelvin. Units of ATM, moles, and Kelvin are cancelled, and units of grams and liters remains. Then the density of carbon tetrachloride is 4.43 grams per liter. Numerous chemical reactions involves consumption or production of gases. We can determine the quantity of gases or moles of gases by utilizing the relationship of moles to the pressure, volume, and temperature in ideal gas equation. Let's try another practice problem. The safety airbags in automobiles are inflated by nitrogen gas generated by the rapid decomposition of sodium azide. The two moles of sodium azide is decomposed into two moles of solid metallic sodium and three moles of gaseous molecular nitrogen. If an airbag has a volume of 36 liters and is to be filled with nitrogen gas at a pressure of 1.15 atm at a temperature of 26 celsius. How many grams of sodium azide must be decomposed? Don't forget that you should determine the gram mass of sodium azide that is decomposed to produce 36 liters of nitrogen gas under 1.15 atm and 26 celsius. The ideal gas equation can be modified to determine the moles of nitrogen gas. So the moles of nitrogen gas equals PV over RT. The volume, pressure, and temperature of nitrogen gas are 36 liters, 1.15 atm, and 26 Celsius respectively. The temperature 26 Celsius is converted to 299 Kelvin. The moles of nitrogen gas is equal to 1.15 atm times 36 liters divided by 0 0.08206 liter atm per mole per Kelvin times 299 Kelvin. Units of atm, liter, and Kelvin are cancelled. Only units of mole remains. The moles of nitrogen is 1.7 moles. The moles of nitrogen gas will be used to determine
the gram mass of sodium azide that is decomposed. The chemical equation shows that the mole ratio of sodium azide to nitrogen is 2 to 3, and molar mass of sodium azide is given as 65.0 grams per mole. We may use this information for the conversion factors in dimensional analysis. The mass of sodium azide is equal to 1.7 moles of nitrogen gas times 2 moles of sodium azide over 3 moles of nitrogen gas times 65.0 grams of sodium azide over 1 mole of sodium azide, which is equal to 74 grams of sodium azide. It implies that 74 grams of sodium azide must be decomposed to produce 1.7 moles of nitrogen gas, which corresponds to 37 liters of nitrogen gas. So far, we have dealt with the behavior of a single pure gas. The question is, if different kinds of gases are mixed, how would the gas mixture behave? In 1801, John Dalton stated the total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the pressures that each would exert if it were present alone. This is well known as Dalton's law of partial pressures. Partial pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by a particular component of a gas mixture. The Dalton's law of partial pressures can be expressed mathematically like total pressure equals the sum of individual partial pressures. Each partial pressure can be written using the ideal gas equation. The partial pressure of gas component 1 is represented by P1 and it is equal to N1 times RT over V. Take a note that the volume of an individual gas component in a mixture is same with the volume of the whole gas mixture. Likewise, the partial pressure of gas component 2 is N2 times RT over V. And the partial pressure of gas component 3 is N3 times RT over V. These partial pressures can be plugged into the equation above. Then, P total can be written like this. You may factor out the RT over V, and the P total can be simplified as the sum of moles of individual gas components times RT over V. In other words, it is P total equals N total times RT over V. The partial pressure of a gas component in a mixture is related to its mole fraction. Here is the ideal gas equation PV equals NRT. It can be re-expressed as P equals NRT over V. This modified ideal gas equation will be utilized to determine the ratio of a partial pressure to the total pressure, that is, P1 over P total. Then, the numerator P1 is replaced by N1RT over V. Likewise, the denominator P total is replaced by N total RT over V. RT over V in the numerator and denominator is the common factor and cancelled. The equation is simplified to N1 over N total. The fraction N1 over N total is denoted as X1 and it is called mole fraction of component 1. Be aware that the mole fraction does not have any unit. 
equation is re-expressed with respect to P1, which is P1 equals X1 times P total. This equation allows us to determine the partial pressure of any gas component in a mixture as long as the total pressure and more fraction of the component are known. Let's try a practice problem. The mole fraction of N2 in air is 0.78, that is 78% of the molecules in air are N2. If the total barometric pressure is 760 torr, then what is the partial pressure of N2? Air is a good example of gas mixture that consists of 78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen gas, and trace amount of all other gases. The partial pressure of nitrogen gas in air is simply its mole fraction times total pressure. That is equal to 0.78 times 760 torr, which is 590 torr. Some chemical reactions generate gases as reaction products. In such case, how do we determine the amount of gas product? One simple and easy way is to collect the gas product over water. One important fact that you should not neglect is that what you collect over water is not only the gas that is produced in the reaction, but also the water vapor that is evaporated during the gas collection. Dalton's law of partial pressures indicates that the total pressure inside a collection flask is the sum of the pressure of gas product and the pressure of water vapor, which is expressed in this equation. P total equals P gas product plus P water vapor. This animation shows a gas collection apparatus and illustrates how to collect gas product over water. A water-filled flask is inverted in a water bath. As the reaction progresses, gaseous product is formed and bubbles through the water and collected in the flask. Once the reaction is completed and stops producing gaseous product anymore, the flask is raised or lowered to equalize the water levels inside and outside the flask. By doing this, we can equalize the pressure inside and outside the flask. The total gas pressure inside the flask is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the flask. This can be expressed in this equation. P total equals P gas product plus P water vapor. Once again, since the water levels inside and outside of flask equals, the total gas pressure inside a flask equals the atmospheric pressure outside a flask. The vapor pressure of water at various temperature is precisely measured, well tabulated, and can be found in literature. And the atmospheric pressure can be measured easily with a barometer. Now the only unknown in the equation is the pressure of gas product and you can easily determine the pressure by a simple math. Let's try a practice problem. Ammonium nitride decomposes upon heating to form nitrogen gas. When a sample of ammonium nitride is decomposed in a test tube, 511 mL of nitrogen gas is collected over water at 26 Celsius and 745 torr total pressure. How many grams of ammonium nitride were decomposed? The vapor pressure of water at 26 Celsius is 25.2 torr, and the molar mass of ammonium nitride is 64.04 grams per mole. In this problem, we should determine the gram mass of ammonium nitride that should be decomposed 
to produce 511 mils of nitrogen gas. The first step is to determine the moles of nitrogen gas to be collected over water. The total pressure inside the test tube equals the pressure of nitrogen gas plus the pressure of water vapor. Then the pressure of nitrogen gas is P total minus P water, which is 745 torr minus 25.2 torr. This will make 719.2 torr. Since 760 torr is equivalent to 1 atm, the pressure of nitrogen gas is converted to 0 0.947 atm. The temperature of 26 Celsius is converted to 299 Kelvin. The volume of gas 511 mils is converted to 0 0.511 liter. We may modify the ideal gas equation to determine the moles of nitrogen gas like this. N equals PV over RT. The moles of nitrogen gas equals 0 0.947 atm times 0 0.511 liter divided by 0 0.08206 liter atm per mole per Kelvin times 299 Kelvin, which is 0 0.0197 mole. The chemical equation that is given in the problem demonstrates that the mole ratio of nitrogen gas to ammonium nitrite is 1 to 1. It implies that 1 mole of nitrogen gas is produced by consuming 1 mole of ammonium nitrite. This will be used for a conversion factor in dimensional analysis. The molar mass of ammonium nitrite is 64.04 grams per mole. And this will be used for another conversion factor in dimensional analysis. Finally, the mass of ammonium nitrite is 0 0.197 mole nitrogen gas times 1 mole ammonium nitrite over 1 mole nitrogen gas times 64.04 grams ammonium nitrite over 1 mole ammonium nitrite which is 1.26 grams of ammonium nitrite. Ideal gas equation was derived from three gas laws. It demonstrates how pressure, volume, quantity of gas, and temperature are related to one another. Assume that moles and temperature are maintained constant. So the right side of the equation becomes a constant as a whole. The equation of state exhibits as pressure increases, then volume decreases, which makes the overall P times V a constant value. It is also equal to the constant NRT. It implies that pressure and volume are inversely proportional to each other. Assume that the volume and moles of gas are maintained constant. The equation of state exhibits as temperature increases, the pressure of gas also increases. In other words, the temperature and pressure of gas are proportional to each other under the condition of constant volume and moles. The ideal gas equation describes how gas behaves when the physical condition changes, but it does not describe why the gas behaves exactly as the equation describes. When a gas is heated to high temperature, the pressure of the gas increases. If the temperature is given, we can easily calculate the pressure of the gas. The question is, what causes the increase of pressure? Kinetic molecular theory of gas describes the bulk properties of gas 
based on the intermolecular interactions of gas particles. It helps us understand how and why gas laws work. It also helps us predict when the gas laws don't work in real circumstances. How would individual gas molecules behave as environmental conditions change? The kinetic molecular theory of gas is summarized as following. Take a note that we are dealing with an ideal gas for now. First, gases consist of large numbers of molecules that are in continuous random motion. The combined volume of all gas molecules is negligible relative to the total volume in which the gas is contained. In reality, however, we cannot neglect the combined volume that is occupied by gas molecules. And this is one of the causes that real gases deviate significantly from ideal behavior. Attractive and repulsive forces between gas molecules are negligible. Be aware that these are only for ideal gases. In case of real gases, these intermolecular forces are not negligible. Energy can be transferred between molecules during collisions, but the average kinetic energy of the molecules does not change with time as long as the temperature of the gas remains constant. These collisions are called elastic collisions. It is due to the fact that the kinetic energy before and after each collision is conserved. The distribution of gas molecules with respect to the molecular speed is shown in this graph. There are three types of speeds that represent how fast the majority of gas molecules move. They are most probable speed, average speed, and Rutman square speed or RMS speed. The most probable speed is positioned at the top of the distribution curve. Average speed is the average speed of individual molecular speeds. Root mean square speed is the square speed of the average speed squared of individual molecules. In general, the root mean square speed is the greatest speed, and the most probable speed is the least speed. Take a note that we are going to use the Rutman square speed to determine the average kinetic energy of gas molecules. The average kinetic energy of molecules is proportional to the absolute temperature. Look at this graph. The distribution of gas molecules is plotted with respect to molecular speed at two temperatures. The blue curve represents the molecular speed at zero Celsius. The red curve represents the molecular speed at 100 Celsius. Lowercase u represents Rutman square speed at a specified temperature. The plot implies the fact that average molecular speed increases as temperature increases. It also implies that average kinetic energy also increases as temperature increases. Remember that the magnitude of pressure is determined by both how often and how forcefully the molecules strike the walls. The empirical observation of gas properties can be interpreted with respect to the kinetic molecular theory. First, how can we rationalize the decrease of gas pressure in molecule level as the volume increases at constant temperature? The kinetic molecular theory implies the average kinetic energy of gas molecules does not change as long as temperature remains constant. Look at these equations. Epsilon represents average kinetic energy of an individual gas molecule, and lowercase u represents RMS speed 
of the gas molecule. As long as temperature remains constant, the initial kinetic energy is the same as the final kinetic energy. Mass of the gas molecule remains the same no matter what. Since the initial and final kinetic energy are the same under the condition of constant temperature, the initial and final RMS speed must be the same. It further implies that RMS speed of molecules remains unchanged as long as temperature remains constant. When the volume of gas increases, each gas molecule travels longer distance and it causes fewer collisions with a container wall per unit time. As a result, the pressure of gas decreases. The next question is, how can we rationalize the increase of pressure caused by the increase of temperature under the condition of constant volume? Once again, the mass of individual gas molecule remains the same. The kinetic molecular theory shows that average kinetic energy of gas molecules increases proportionally as temperature increases. It implies if final temperature is greater than initial temperature, epsilon final is greater than epsilon initial. In other words, final kinetic energy is greater than initial kinetic energy. It also implies that final RMS speed is greater than initial RMS speed. In summary, increase of temperature causes increase of molecular speed, which leads to more collisions per unit time. As a result, this increases the pressure of gas. The ideal gas equation can be derived qualitatively from the kinetic molecular theory. Pressure can be interpreted as the total force of the molecules that collide with the container walls. So the pressure is proportional to impulse imparted per collision times collision rate. Impulse imparted per collision is understood as the change of momentum per collision. Collision rate is proportional to the number of molecules per unit volume or N over V. And the collision rate is also proportional to molecular speed U. Overall, pressure is proportional to MU times N over V times U, which is equal to NMU squared over V. Average kinetic energy is one half times MU squared and it is proportional to temperature. In general, we can say that MU squared is proportional to temperature. As a result, pressure is proportional to NT over V. If we use a proportionality constant R, then the equation will be P equals R times NT over V, or PV equals NRT, which is the ideal gas equation. Imagine that you have a collection of heavy gas particles and a collection of light gas particles. Assume that the temperature of the gases remains constant. The kinetic molecular theory indicates that the average kinetic energy of gas has one single value as long as temperature is kept constant, no matter how heavy or light the gas particles are. Let's express this conceptual understanding in a mathematical equation. At the same temperature, the average kinetic energy of light gas particles equals the average kinetic energy of heavy gas particles. This can be re-expressed like one half m sub l times u sub l squared equals one half m sub h times u sub h squared. Since the mass of light particles is less than the mass of heavy particles, the RMS speed of light particles should be greater than 
the RMS speed of heavy particles to make the equation valid. It implies that the heavier the particles are, the slower they move, and the lighter they are, the faster they move. The actual RMS speed of a collection of gas particles can be derived with Maxwell distribution function. The derived RMS speed is equal to square root 3RT over capital M. The capital M represents molar mass of gas particles. This equation shows that the molecular speed is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass of the gas particles. This plot shows the distribution of molecular speeds of several gases at 25 Celsius. As you go from left to right in the plot, the mass of each gas decreases in the order of molecular oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor, helium, and hydrogen. On the contrary, the RMS speed of the gases increases. This is another evidence that proves the fact that as gas particles become lighter, they move faster. Let's try a practice problem. What is the RMS speed of a helium atom at 25 Celsius? Mathematically expressed RMS speed is given on the left. Plug the molar mass and temperature into the equation. Don't forget to make the units consistent. If not, you will end up with an incorrect answer. The molar mass of helium is 4.00 grams per mole. Keep in mind that SI unit of mass is kilograms, not grams. So the SI unit of molar mass is kilograms per mole, not grams per mole. The molar mass of helium can be converted to 4.00 times 10 to the negative third kilograms per mole. Since SI unit of temperature is Kelvin, 25 Celsius should be converted to 298 Kelvin. The ideal gas constant R that is in SI units is 8.314 Joule per mole per Kelvin. The RMS speed equals square root 3RT over M, which is equal to square root 3 times 8.314 Joule per mole per Kelvin times 298 Kelvin over 4.00 times 10 to the negative third kilograms per mole. The units of mole and Kelvin are cancelled. Now that is equal to square root 1.86 times 10 to the 6 Joules per kilogram. The unit joule is equivalent to kilograms meter squared per second squared. Unit kilogram is cancelled. Then the RMS speed of helium atom at 25 Celsius is 1.36 times 10 to the third meters per second. The dependence of molecular speed on mass brings about two interesting phenomena. The first one is called effusion, and the second one is called diffusion. Effusion is the process where individual gas molecules flow through a tiny hole in a container. One example of effusion is a balloon filled with gas. The gas in the balloon effuses slowly through tiny pores in the balloon. Diffusion, however, is the spread of one substance throughout a space or throughout a second substance. Imagine that someone nearby wears perfume. You may smell the fragrance even if you are at a certain distance from the person. This is because the perfume particles travel through the air and eventually reach your nose. This is called Diffusion. 
In 1846, Thomas Graham discovered that effusion rate of a gas R is inversely proportional to the square root of its molar mass. Let's prove the validity of Graham's law of effusion by taking the rate of effusion of two different gases under identical conditions. As we derived previously, the molecular speed equals square root 3RT over M. This implies that the molecular speed is inversely proportional to the square root of molar mass. It is logical to say that molecular speed is proportional to the effusion rate. It further implies that effusion rate ratio of two different gases is same as the molecular speed ratio of the two gases. So R1 over R2 is equal to U1 over U2. Plug the molecular speeds into the ratio U1 over U2. Then it will be square root 3RT over M1 divided by 3RT over M2. The 3RT is cancelled. This leads to a mathematical relationship between effusion rate and molar mass of gas. That is R1 over R2 equals square root M2 over M1. It implies that effusion rate of a gas R is inversely proportional to the square root of its molar mass. Once again, that is the Graham's law of effusion. It further implies that lighter gas effuses more rapidly. For example, helium is approximately seven times lighter than nitrogen gas. As a result, helium would effuse much faster than nitrogen. And that is all about the Graham's law. This picture shows two balloons of equal size. The blue one is filled with nitrogen gas, and red one is filled with helium gas. One day later, the size of red balloon is reduced substantially, while that of blue balloon almost retains its initial size. This is because the lighter gas, helium, effuses much faster. Just like effusion, lower mass molecules diffuse faster than higher mass molecules. But diffusion is more complicated than effusion because gas molecules collide with medium gas in the course of diffusion. Mean free path is defined as the average distance traveled by a molecule between collisions in the course of diffusion. It is influenced greatly by pressure and temperature. Take a note that the mean free path of gas increases as quantity of gas decreases in fixed volume. Be aware that the mean free path decreases as temperature of gas increases. Imagine that there is one mole of ideal gas. The ideal gas equation PV equals nRT can be re-expressed with respect to moles. Then it will be N equals PV over RT. Since we have one mole of ideal gas, the PV over RT is equal to 1. It implies that if we have one mole of ideal gas, the PV over RT always makes the value 1, regardless of pressure, volume, and temperature. Now, think about real gases. If you plug the pressure, volume, and temperature of a real gas into the PV over RT, the chances are it is either higher or lower than 1. If, however, the result is 1, then you may say that the real gas behaves ideally. In general, PV over RT is used to determine the degree of deviation of real gases 
from ideal behavior. Look at the plot on the right. PV over RT is plotted with respect to pressure. The PV over RT of ideal gas always makes 1, no matter how high or low the pressure is. However, the values of PV over RT for real gases like nitrogen, methane, hydrogen, or carbon dioxide deviate substantially from the ideal value 1. The deviation of real gases from ideal behavior is substantially high at high pressure. Now, this plot shows how the PV over RT of a single real gas changes as temperature changes. The value for ideal gas is also shown for reference, and it maintains the ideal value 1, regardless of temperature and pressure. Look at the curves for individual temperatures. Do you see any trend? The value of PV over RT of a real gas becomes close to the ideal value 1 as temperature increases. It implies that real gas behaves ideally at high temperature. It further implies that the degree of deviation from ideal behavior increases as temperature decreases. How can we interpret this trend? If a real gas is cooled to lower temperature, what do you expect to happen? If the temperature keeps decreasing, the gas will be liquefied eventually, which is far from being a gas. In other words, gas behaves more like a liquid at lower temperature. It implies that the degree of deviation from ideal behavior increases as temperature decreases. Real gases are the ones that deviate from ideal behavior. As we learned previously, the ideal gas does not occupy any space. In other words, the volume occupied by ideal gas is zero. And ideal gas particles do not interact among themselves. However, it is a totally different story if it is a real gas. Number one, a real gas occupies finite volume. And number two, there are non-negligible intermolecular attractions. Look at the plot above. This plot can be split into three regions. Region one in the plot is the area under low pressure. In order to make gas pressure low, you have to expand the volume, as you can see in the picture. In such high volume of container, the actual volume that is occupied by gas particles is negligibly small, and since the distance between gas particles is so large, their intermolecular attraction becomes negligible. This makes real gas behave ideally in the pressure region 1. For the same reason, the value of PV over RT becomes close to the ideal value 1 in this region. Region 2 is the area under moderately high pressure. Now, the intermolecular attraction becomes greater because the gas particles become physically closer. The greater intermolecular attractions makes the real gas particles collide with walls more weakly and decrease the pressure below the ideal pressure. This would make the value of PV over RT below the ideal value 1. Take a note that pressure is positioned in the numerator of PV over RT. Lower pressure makes the value of PV over RT smaller. Region 3 is the area under extremely high pressure. Now, the intermolecular repulsion becomes dominant in this high pressure region because the gas particles are 
fiscally too close due to greatly reduced volume. The volume occupied by individual real gas particles are not negligible anymore in this region. As a result, individual gas particles experience substantially high repulsion from one another. This intermolecular repulsion would cause additional increase of gas pressure and makes the value PV over RT higher than the ideal value 1. Van der Waals equation is one of equations of state for real gases and it is derived from the ideal gas equation. We learned that individual real gas molecules occupy certain volume while ideal gas molecules do not occupy any space. We also learned that real gas molecules have intermolecular interactions while ideal gas molecules do not interact with one another. The equation of state for real gases should include these two factors. Number one, the volume occupied by real gas molecules, and number two, the intermolecular attractions. Let's rewrite the ideal gas equation with respect to pressure. Then it will be P equals nRT over V. In order to derive an equation of state for real gas, we have to add correction for the volume occupied by real gas molecules, which is NB. And we also add correction for molecular traction, which corresponds to N squared A over V squared. This is called Van der Waals equation. The Van der Waals equation can be rewritten as P plus N squared A over V squared times V minus NB equals nRT. Be aware that A and B are called Van der Waals coefficients, and they are different in magnitude from gas to gas. Experimentally determined Van der Waals coefficients of several gases are shown in this table. Take a note, the Van der Waals coefficient B is the molar volume of each gas in the list.